This is Support is Sexy, episode 407, with Shannon Klingman, inventor and CEO of Lumi Deodorant. Welcome to Support is Sexy. I'm your host, Elaine Fluker, entrepreneur, author, and founder of Chic Rebellion Media. Five days a week, Monday through Friday, I bring you inspiring women entrepreneurs who share their wins and lessons to help you take your business to the next level. Here we go. Hi, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of Support is Sexy. I'm excited to have you here. It just would not be the same without you. And if you are a woman entrepreneur, a leader, a coach, a consultant, a CEO, anyone who wants to get your story out there in front of more people, have more people hear your story, know what you're up to and be engaged with you and your brand, consider podcast guesting. Being a podcast guest is an incredible way to connect with new audiences again and again. And if you need some support with how to be a great podcast guest, I want you to download my free guide, How to Be an Unforgettable Podcast Guest at girlonpodcastgift.com. That's girlonpodcastgift.com. Learn how to get booked again and again, how to be prepared for your interviews, and how to be unforgettable for all the right reasons. Now, our guest today is unforgettable, Ms. Shannon Klingman. Shannon is the CEO and inventor of Lumi Deodorant, which is a feminine hygiene product that is really disrupting the industry. What I love about Shannon's story is, one, her dogged determination to create this product to solve a problem for women, a pain point that she saw as an OBGYN with her patients and then through her own experiences. But also, Shannon is committed to shifting the narrative around feminine hygiene. And in this episode, she tells you how she plans to do that, how she created Lumi, including the scientific research that went into it, what it's like to be an inventor and get a patent, and what it means to share your message authentically and remain committed to the core of your brand. So I know you're going to love this episode. Just so you know, we do talk about lady parts in here, feminine hygiene, and other things that were important to the creation of Lumi. Just in case you're in the car with the kids, I think it's great for them to hear about it. This is a part of life, but just to give you a heads up. All right, so now, without further ado, Shannon Klingman. So Shannon, thank you so much for joining me for an episode of Support is Sexy. I'm excited to chat with you. Thank you very much, Elaine, for having me today. Of course. So our first question, when did you first fall in love with entrepreneurship? Well, I was raised by a single mom until I was about nine years old when she met and married my stepfather, who really I credit with raising me in parallel with my mom. And he owned a restaurant and ran a restaurant for years. And so I would see him getting up at four in the morning to, you know, go prep the, the, the days, you know, the, the food for the day and get the wait staff all set up. And, and he was just tireless in that, being able to get up early in the morning. And I think he worked very hard, but he was the master of his own, you know, domain, so to speak. And, and I think that I realized at a really young age that, I would say around junior high when I started working for my dad that in the restaurant that I really was somebody who probably would do best if I didn't have a boss. Mm. <laughs> and so, so and, I, and I don't mean that in a way that I wasn't obstinate or difficult to get along with, but I was always looking at things and ways to improve things. Like, you know how we could do this better? Or, you know, I was an idea person for, at a very early age. And so that leadership, uh, vi- I was a, kind of a visionary for things, uh, really told me early on that I probably was not going to be somebody you know, sitting in a cubicle from nine to five every day. Now, where did you grow up? I'm a, I'm a Midwestern girl. Ah. So I was, yeah, so I was, and I moved all over. I was born in Clinton, Iowa mm-hmm. and lived there until I was about eight and then moved to uh, Waukee, Iowa, which is just outside of Des Moines through junior high and then w- moved to Rice Lake, Wisconsin for high school, like eighth grade through high school. And then I uh, went to college at the University of Michigan in Dearborn out of Detroit and then did medical school down at Wayne State University and did a residency there and practiced there a few years. So I kind of consider myself to be from Michigan. I lived there longer than anywhere else. I love the Detroit area. 
And my family then settled in the Twin Cities, everybody collectively. And so I ventured and made my way here to Minneapolis. Oh, nice. I love it. You really are a Midwestern girl, though. Yes. Yes, I am. (laughs) Now, how would you say that, um, I know later on, obviously, being a leader and a visionary has served you, which we'll talk about. But as a Mm -hmm. kid growing up in the Midwest, were there ever times when your visionary attitude or this idea of, you know how we could do this better kind of got in Mm -hmm. your way? Yes, I I think that when you're a kid, I was not a rule follower. Mm -hmm. Um, I saw rules as guidelines, you know, like this is what they would like, but this doesn't make sense. And I, I oftentimes got into trouble because I felt like rules didn't apply to me. Right. And, uh, and I know that I'm sounding like I was a real troublemaker. And that really, that really wasn't the case. But I questioned uh, things like if I saw curious. this was, yes, but also even like socially, I really had a heart for the underdog very mm. early on with kids in my class. You know, I was one of the original social justice warriors, I would say, like as a, even as a very young kid. And so I put my nose into other people's business where it didn't belong, uh, where I saw the mistreatment of people or the way things could be done uh, differently or how we could improve on a process or a procedure. And so, you know, when you're 12 and you're saying things like that, nobody really is listening uh, and considers you credible until you are an adult and you have some credentials and have earned the, you know, the, the ability to make suggestions like that. So I wasn't an easy kid to raise. I was really bullheaded, pretty stubborn. Uh, I was always telling my mom, it's my life, mom, you know, you just got to oh, trust right. me. It's my life. <laughs> so, You're it's like my 16. Life. It's my life. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I think, and, and then I think when I graduated from medical school, my mom wrote me a note, a really special note that she put in my card. Um, when I was graduating, and she said, you know, all those years when you would say to me, it's my life. Uh, I really, you're right. It, and you have paved your own path. And you're right. You've just always been a problem solver. And you've been somebody that when you set your sights on something, you're like a dog with a bone. And it's one of the things that we love the most about you. So while I think I was a difficult child to raise, I don't think she ever worried about my ability to take care of myself. Right. Uh, and there's something really nice about that feeling, I think, as a parent that I now realize as a mother. <laughs> That's beautiful. I love that. And sometimes mm-hmm. we don't get to hear that message from our moms or as moms remember to tell that to our children, just like, you turned out okay. Yeah. I'm proud yeah, of you. You were, you, you were right. It was you your right. life. You, exactly. you made some good decisions, you know? So, right. That's excellent. Yeah. So let's talk about then this vision that you had for Lumi deodorant and how you mm-hmm. really uh, focused on that and making that a reality. You know, it's, if someone would have told me when I first had the idea that, hey, you know what? In about 10 years, this is going to come to fruition. Uh, I maybe would have thought, ah, this is too hard, you know, mm-hmm. and, and, and I maybe would have said, really? Wow, okay, then it's not possible, and listen to those, those voices, uh, but th- the way that it happened was really quite organic, and it just, I was a resident seeing patients in the office, <clears throat> and we would see large num- volumes of patients, just, uh, we worked in, uh, in an area outside of Detroit where we saw people from the entire metro area, all walks of life. And you're an OBGYN. Yes, and mm-hmm. I was in my OBGYN residency at the time. Mm-hmm. And it seemed like everybody that was coming in, whether you know they're coming in for just their annual pap smear or for a, a birth control pill refill, that odor always came up. They, women have concerns about day-to-day odor. They become insecure about it, mm-hmm. um, either in their intimate relationships or in just the way that they're perceiving their own their own self. And uh, and so what I was finding is that women complain of odor. We do the the routine tests. We use like something called Amsel's criteria to evaluate vaginal odor, and then we you know use va- put vaginal discharge under our microscope and take a look at it and look at the pH of the discharge. And we kind of collectively take in a lot of subjective data, meaning. There's a, an element of interpretation to it. But when you're sitting there facing a patient that has a complaint of odor and you're noticing that it's consistent with a condition called bacterial vaginosis, which is uh, can be a, a fishy odor that women will get from time to time, uh, you're more likely to want to treat them because they're concerned about it. And as a physician, you want to offer a remedy. But when those lab tests were coming back, they were very inconsistent with the diagnosis of BV or bacterial vaginosis, but your your patients already left with an antibiotic they probably didn't need. Mm. And and I remember talking to my colleagues about this, saying, 
Do you just ever feel like you're beating your head up against the wall with bacterial vaginosis? That diagnosis just seems so imperfect. And it's like, yeah, yeah, well, go see your next patient because you <laughs> they're right. coming every 12 minutes, you know? Right. And so, so this was in my mind. And then fast forward a little bit to where uh, my husband and I are now trying to have a baby. And we're both full-time practicing OBGYNs. And I'm no longer practicing, but at the time I was. And you know, so when you're trying to conceive, I mean, you, the time is now mm-hmm. and we would get together and it, inevitably one of us was on call and I just had this where I'm up all night with patients and maybe got home for a little bit that night, but then I'm back at the hospital with patients and up in the office the next day and, and I, you know, wasn't able to shower and I noticed that I went go, went to use the bathroom and I sat down and I had that odor that so many women have complained about. And I'm like, oh my goodness! I had the same thought. Like, do I have do I have an infection? Do right. I have bacterial vaginosis? That's the first thing you think something's wrong with you, right? And I, so as a gynecologist and as a persistent woman and a problem solver, I thought there is no way I have BV. No way. I went through the checklist. I, my, you know, there's no way. And so I did some checking around and some, you know, and realized that this odor was not vaginal. It was all external, but it had the same odor as BV. So I talked to my husband about that. And I said, you know, I've been frustrated with the diagnosis of BV for years. It's been like this thing that just nags at me that we're, we're really handing out antibiotics unnecessarily, I think often, far too often. And as gynecologists, and then I realized that this is external. So I talked to him about, you know, maybe we should conduct a study and see if this is the exact same odor that's formed with BV and it's called trimethylamine. So that's the, the fishy odor gas that gets formed. So we hired an outside lab to conduct a study and I won't you know, bore you with all the real nitty gritty details, but ultimately what happened was the odor molecules that form on the outside of our body when bacteria that are commonly found in our GI tract digest bodily fluids that are high in certain amino acids, so like semen or blood, you get a release of, of these foul, fishy odors, and it was indistinguishable from the trimethylamine that forms with BV. Mm-hmm. So no wonder doctors are overdiagnosing it. Right. And, this, and then a study came out in 2006 that demonstrated that doctors overdiagnose bacterial vaginosis 61% of the time, and they're overdiagnosing yeast vaginitis 73% of the time. Wow, that's really high. And prescribing yes. antibiotics in most of those cases. Yes. And so what they did is they took a group of women that came in with vaginal complaints. They had a, a panel of doctors evaluate it. And then they had like CDC guidelines, like actual infectious disease individuals, then take a look and examine these women and do the run them through the proper um, testing with blinded. So you don't, you haven't met the patient. You're just exam, you're just getting the physical symptoms and then some, a discharge sample and you're, you're, they're going through the diagnostic process. And it was confirmed that yes, indeed, that doctors are better off rolling the dice and determining whether or not a woman has BV or candida or yeast vaginitis. And so it was very consistent with what I was noticing in my own practice. So I felt like, okay, game on, I'm going to solve this problem. I am going to, I am a myth buster for women. I'm going to change the narrative on feminine hygiene because women have been led to believe that it's all vaginal odor, vaginal, the vagina is the problem. When you look at, when you go into a pharmacy and you look at the lineup of all the products that are on the shelf, douching, uh, products that you insert into the vagina, um, every wash and wipe describes vaginal odor for your vaginal health. When Really, the vagina has nothing to do with it. It's just serving as a reservoir for these bodily fluids like blood and semen. And even after you've had some babies, it's not uncommon to leak urine when you cough, sneeze, or laugh. Um, And then perspiration. And our anatomy is so close together as a woman that it's inevitable that these fluids are going to come into contact with our with our perirectal area and and we'll digest those fluids. And so it was an external problem and it needed an external solution. So I created that. And it has become, like even when we launched the product in October, four months later now, I realized that this story is even more important than I ever realized back when I first had the idea. And that's really exciting to me to know that 
we will change the narrative on feminine hygiene for women from now into the future. I just need to tell the story enough times to, to get that truth out so women change the way that they feel about their bodies. I love it. That's so powerful, Shannon. Thank you for sharing Thank you. sharing the journey, too, and how it all came, came to be as an idea and then the science behind it, too. Mm-hmm. Now, when you were thinking about the solution, what made you or what let you know uh, that deodorant was the answer and not um, something else, some other kind of medicine or, you know, mm-hmm. some other kind of hygiene practice or anything like that? Was that through the lab also? Well, you know, we use the word deodorant because there's really no other way to describe it in the market. Meaning, if you want people to find you, people think of body odor control. Those are either deodorants or antiperspirants, but really we're neither. uh, Because uh, antiperspirants contain aluminum that blocks sweat. And then by minimizing the perspiration, you're minimizing the bodily fluids that bacteria can digest and then ultimately lead to odor. And then they also are very heavily fragranced, and so there's a there's a cover up component to it. Mm-hmm. What deodorants do on the market up until now? So I'm talking every other product now besides Lumi. Uh, they deodorize uh, by using heavily fragranced cover ups, and I don't care if it's fragrance oils or essential oils. They tend to be more heavily fragranced, and then they'll contain ingredients sometimes like botanicals, herbs. Um, or certain essential oils that may have some antimicrobial properties, but they're very weak. Um, And so they're not very long lasting. So the reapplication habit is very common with natural deodorants. And then about five years ago, there was a resurgence of baking soda in natural deodorants. Mm -hmm. And while baking soda has a very high pH, it's like putting on soap or detergent and leaving it on. So there is an antibacterial property to it. Again, it's it's uh, pretty weak, but the baking soda actually chemically neutralizes the odor after it forms. So as you begin to perspire and the bacteria are replicating and that odor overcomes the ability for the baking soda to neutralize it, because really baking soda needs to be in, in, a, in a water-based solution to mm-hmm. work as that acid-base reaction. And all of these are really in oils and butters. So they put a ton of baking soda in coconut oil and shea butter and beeswax, and they feel really nice. Um, but there's a couple problems with it. Baking soda's pH is way too high to use anywhere else on your body. And baking soda is one of the leading ingredients that causes chemical burns on your skin. So it's not a great leave-on for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. And so I thought, so though that's antiperspirants and deodorants. What Lumi does is Lumi, so rather than neutralizing the odor or minimizing the bacteria, while we do also do those things, we also inhibit, totally paralyze, 100% inhibit is what we found in the lab, the enzyme that is responsible for bacteria to digest bodily fluids. We inhibit that, that enzyme. So we're, do, we're hitting that angle, plus we do minimize the bacterial growth and replication rate, and then we also neutralize any odor that is formed. So it's a triple approach, and we're really more of a prophylactic than a deodorant, but then you say prophylactic and people think, you know, condom Condoms, or... right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, like, so, we, so, rather yeah. Than tra- I know, so rather than trying to, like, rename the whole industry, we really are a body odor control product, so we call ourselves a deodorant. But we took the science in a whole new direction. And it really, as a gynecologist, I initially solved odor between our legs as women. And then being a varsity, like underarm stinker, I, I, first (laughs) of all, I I will, I mean, I think like this was a God given like trait because (laughs) it helped me to solve the problem. I will you have intimate like, knowledge of it. I know exactly like six hours into it. It's a little oniony 12 <laughs> hours into it. I'm like dinty more beef stew. <laughs> the next day it's like not even human. I mean, I'm such an underarm stinker. Wait, so I was so a great funny. candidate to, so to test funny. this my, out. My friend, best friend and I talk about, and I'm, this is why I'm so intrigued by this. Well, one, because it's so innovative, but also because we use natural deodorant. My friends and I talk oh, about wonderful. You know, not using um, aluminum, but I actually, I won't hate is a strong word, but I actually don't love natural deodorant because I tell my friends a few few hours later, I feel like I smell like a water buffalo. I have yes, no idea what work. a water buffalo yeah. smells like, but I think <laughs> that is what You it. think you may have pegged I it? I may yeah. have pegged it. So that's why it's yeah, so I interesting that. that you say that. 
Well, so what, uh, you know, one thing that's interesting about that is the, the, when I started using the feminine hygiene cream, when I invented it, like this is just in the initial formulary stage. Like I am like, I, initially I had no idea what I was doing. I just know what I wanted the end result to be. Mm-hmm. And I would not give up. I would call formularies. I asked a ton of questions. I was, you know, I wanted to remain true to ingredients that, that I knew consumers were looking for. Um, but those, you know, those, some of those things are faddish, right? So what's, what was important when I first started formulating it changed. And so it was like, no, we can't use that preservative. And I educated myself on the safest ingredients, knowing that your skin's your largest organ and you're going to be absorbing this. I wanted nursing mothers and pregnant women and children to be able to feel comfortable using this. And so the process of formulation is not a straight path. But when I started using these formulas on my underarms, what I said, my goodness, this is like this is like the best deodorant for my underarms I've ever u- ever tried. Plus, the reason I don't like aluminum as a physician is, I mean, other than I think it's probably not a good idea to use a heavy metal on your skin every day. Mm-hmm. Um, just t- keeping the the medical stuff aside, when you're looking at it personally, aluminum stains your clothes. They're, they're not water-based, so they're wax and oil-based that sticks to your clothing. You get like this plaque of residual deodorant and BO in your clothes that just does not wash out. Mm-hmm. And so I knew I wanted Lumi to be water-based because I'd already ruined enough clothes. And then I was advised to like, well, you need a feminine hygiene cream, and then you need an underarm deodorant, and people will buy more, right, because you're marketing it. But I was able to bring the formula into one where... I wanted full transparency, like, hey, listen, there's a way that products that are solving underarm odor approach those odor molecules, but that does not apply head to toe. What I've accomplished is I have, I have solved body odor head to toe because I took it in a completely different direction. Our ingredients are patented. It's based in science. We've been clinically proven. We know we're effective. And what's so exciting to me And a little bit frightening, actually a lot frightening, is to think that I'm a one-off inventor. I'm not Procter & Gamble or Unilever that has a huge budget behind me. Mm -hmm. And and it's really been that I have been aligned with really great people that have helped me. I did not do this alone. They have my patent writer, amazing, never gave up on me, uh, believed in this invention. Um, as a, he was a patent writer for Kimberly Clark for, I think, over 20 years. Very bright man. He's, his, his intellect, like I always have to tell him, Jeff, you got to dumb this down for me because you're like right. way, uh, way above me right now. Uh, and so it's, it, what's the most exciting is that it took a gynecologist, and I joke about it, to solve those odors in a completely different way that changed the way we're now I'm thinking about body odors and it, it works for feet. It works for under tummy folds. Women use it under their breasts, heavy, you know, people that are, that are heavy set that have a lot of skin folds. I say, if your skin fold can hold a pencil, then chances are you have odor there. And we hear from people every day that talk about what this has done for them. And so that I think is a good thing. And I think it's the reason I, pr- I went to medical school. I, th- I, I love delivering babies and doing surgeries, but this ultimately, other than my children, this will be my mark on the world. This feels like your purpose. Mm-hmm. It does. I yeah. love that. Now, speaking about the patent, tell us a little bit about, uh, you don't have to give us all the details of it because I'm sure it, that's complicated also. Like you said, you have to tell him to bring it down a little bit. But yes, what yeah. was that? Um, what is that process like for anyone out there who might have their own idea or invention and want to know about getting a patent? What was your, I should say, what were your steps in order to get that filed? Well, the first thing you need to do is do a prior art search and make sure that there's not anything else on the market like your product or your idea. Um, and then just because it may, it, you know, it doesn't have to be on the market to have already been a suggestion or to be patented. So when you hire a patent writer or a, a patent attorney, they will do a very extensive prior art search to look for other intellectual property that may match yours or may conflict uh, and already be out there. So it's like, did you just invent a better mousetrap or is this something that's completely different and innovative? Uh, and then you start that process of telling your story and what what parts of it are protectable, you know, or um, proprietary. And then it's up to your patent writer to use the right language and to create those claims that they then submit to the U- USPTO, 
the, uh, the patent office in Washington, D.C. And once it's filed, it can sit on the desk of a patent officer for two to three years, mm. anywhere from 18 months to three years before they get to it. And when you get to the top of the stack, now they start evaluating. And they are looking for loopholes and they're looking for ways to shoot it down and to not give you a patent. It's very difficult to receive a patent today. There's an attitude of there's nothing new out there. And you, you'll get rejections that you have to then defend or you need to revise your claims. And this process for us has taken about seven years. Wow. Uh, up till now. So five, I got my first patent five years into it mm -hmm. and my second patent six years into it. And we have a third one pending that we're still working on now. So, so the different patents are for it. So you don't get one patent for Lumi deodorant overall. You get it for different parts of the process. Or yes, different because components we have, the... yep, we have different active ingredients that right. we have that are, that the formula is patented of course. And then also, um, because we're a total body application, we're protecting that as well. So mm -hmm. the use area, the areas of use. Um, and so that's, uh, it is a process that is a lot like getting a root canal, but then Christmas comes and you're like, oh, it was totally worth it. It was you worth know? it. So <laughs> it's 10 year journey. Totally worth it. Yeah. Right. I love right. It. Now, do you, um, what is your vision, would you say, for Lumi deodorant as far as are you looking to, obviously you're looking to grow it. And I know you have a, mm -hmm. a very powerful vision of shifting a narrative. I'm all for that. Women controlling their own narratives. Um, but mm -hmm. would you say your vision is to grow the company and then sell it to a bigger company like a Procter & Gamble or whichever other company out there? or are, have you not thought that far yet? Is it really about um, your passion well, for it right now? Well, for right now, I'm building the brand and mm -hmm. I'm building and I'm telling the story. And I think I'm the only, I am the only gynecologist that is telling this story. There are a lot of people saying that, you know, that vaginal odor is fine. Vaginas have odor and that's normal. And we need to just embrace that and not be so. Um, and that's not fine. But, but, but what I say is, but, but see, here's meaning people will say that, it's the if vaginas have oh, have an odor i mean it fluctuates and that's true and i'm saying i'm not ta even talking about vaginal odor i'm the only one who's recognized that that external odor is identical to the odors that women experience with conditions that might require antibiotics mm -hmm. and so so i'm busting up that myth that the vagina is to blame because the vast majority of the time the vagina is not to blame and that is my mission right now. I want to tell that story. And I think I'm the only one right now who can do that for this brand. Uh, but I do think, like I just recently auditioned for Shark Tank yes. a couple weeks ago. And my goal with that, my goal is not so much the money. I am not looking for a monetary save because I could find venture capitalists. I actually get approached about people investing quite often mm -hmm. and wanting to invest in our brand, but I don't need the money. I'd rather just go to a bank and get a line of credit if that's what I need. What I need, I am, a, I am an expert in my field, meaning I am a physician who has solved a problem for all humans. It started off as women, but one third of our customers are men. But the remarkable story is we're changing the narrative on feminine hygiene. That's very important to me. And what I need is a strategic partner now, because while I might be able to develop products and tell the story and be the visionary, running a business and really getting it to scale and grow is, is a challenge because you will, you knock on a lot of doors and you get a no a lot. Like, do you want to tell my story? And they're like, nah, you're not Gwyneth Paltrow. No, you're not, you know. Mm -hmm. But if you're a celebrity and you come out with this amazing idea, they'd probably get the, you know, the Nobel Prize for even invention. Even though they may and not have even come up with it. They may just be the face, right? Yeah, but even if they did, even if they did come up with it, let's say, and they they did innovate this, the, the thing that when you don't have a name, when, you're, when your face has no name to them, um, it's difficult to tell your story and, and uh, have people, and I'm talking like the... O Magazine or Ellen or Good Housekeeping and those national outlets that I think if I, w if I had just, a, I just, it's, I'm one connection away from that story being told uh, to somebody who will then be a mouthpiece. 
And I think I may need some help with that. And it'll come. We're connecting the dots. I'm telling, I tell the story to everybody I possibly can. That's what you have to do. Share your (laughs) story. You never know who will share it with someone else. I'm excited to share your story. I think it's very powerful. And I I think you're right. Like you said, you're one connect. You always say one connection, one call, one interaction, but you have to continue to share the story. Yes, yes. And it's, and it really for me is about, I want Lumi to become a household name for people. We say, and did you Lumi today? Did you and, Lumi today? Mm-hmm, because it, we're clinically proven to provide 48 hours of odor control. We're a head to toe product. We're also natural. And so we're the perfect skip a shower deodorant. So my sister and I, and she and I work together. She's my operations manager. She said, uh, Something like, oh, I need to go take a shower. Or I said, I have to go take a shower. It was me who said it. I said, oh, I need to go take a quick shower before we have this meeting. And my sister said, didn't you Lumi today? <gasps> Were you so and I was like, I would have wept. <laughs> yeah, I was like, yes, that's I did. it. Did you Lumi today? <laughs> so. I, I think, too, um, just to, from uh, just listening as a, you know, just an idea, um, obviously without any background of what you already have in the works. But you, when you mentioned skipping a shower, I right away thought about um, athletes or people who camp or different industries that you could also tell your story to that might be interesting, interested, excuse me, outside of, you know, the OMAG or in addition to, we'll say, the O yeah, magazine. Yeah, in addition to Miss O. Yeah, because yeah, maybe some, Winfrey. exactly, President Winfrey. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe, you know what I mean? Like maybe hope. there are some yes. camping magazines that do a product section or something like that, like some other areas. I'll, and I'll send you some ideas too, just having okay, come from media and magazines and all that, just the kind of stories that people are looking for or the angle you know maybe it's more about Mm -hmm. you as the mom and this experience then and then you add in that you have this product you know there's all kinds of ways to do it I'm sure Renee is on it but I'll send some ideas too oh yeah she is yeah (laughs) Yeah. Renee is and and I I think that the one thing I I, that I I wrote a blog yesterday about um you know go ahead and skip a shower because nobody will nobody else will know but you Mm. and it's not published yet but we're we're just going through editing right now Mm -hmm. and what I think is the absolute most important thing for me is to just remain authentic. I am who I am. I, I've never met a stranger. I love people. I can find common ground with every single person. I mean, I've, we all have similar experiences, right, as human beings. We've all had struggles and hardships, and we can identify with one another. And I think if you have empathy for people and you're able to share your own vulnerabilities, you have an ability to connect with people on a level that if you're guarded and you're trying to put up a different face for, you know, that you're in control all the time and you're, you know, infallible, that you really miss out on sharing those, those connections with people. And that's one thing that I have, you know, it's like, love me or hate me. I, I have my, I wear my heart on my sleeve. I'm a sharer. And I'm very willing to talk about my own vulnerabilities. And I think women identify with that because then they don't have to say it out loud themselves. She just said it. See what she said. That's me too, you know? Right. And so I just, so that's what I think I is, that's what I think diff, how we are different from other quote deodorant companies is that we really do have a face. Our brand has a personality and we have stories to tell. So I love it. If you're ever in Atlanta, let me know. I'm starting to host um, with the um, Digital Undivided, this company here, a technology company owned by uh, Catherine Finney. She is hosting um, Innovation Thursdays, where we're going to have women entrepreneurs from all different industries, not even just technology, but come in and talk about something that they've done or created and their experiences. So I think you would be great for something like that in front of a group of people. So it's like a, a fireside conversation. Yeah, I love Fireside, and my, my, I'm working on my TED Talk right now. Nice. Um, and so, I, you know, just because I'm, I don't need to be in, I can fly to Atlanta. So you let me know when that is, and I would love to be considered, a, you know, to be awesome. a part of that. Connections, yes. Yay, and we yeah. we must get T-shirts that says the vagina is not to blame. Is that what the phrase that you said? Yeah, I, the <laughs> vagina is not to blame. The vagina the other, is yeah. not to blame. That's such a statement for the time we're in right now. Yes, and the, the other thing that, that someone told me, who shall remain nameless, is they said with Lumi, the next time you scratch and sniff, you'll be pleasantly surprised. Oh and I'm gosh. like, perfect. <laughs> hey, we all do it. It's like, it's like, you know, we all do it. So let's just embrace it and put that on a t-shirt. That's, so- <laughs> That's amazing. Now, yeah. what, what would you say, Shannon, entrepreneurship has taught you about yourself as a woman? I think that uh, the 
that if I had to think about what, you know, being an entrepreneur and what that's taught me as a woman, I think I, I think I already had it. Um, I think I already knew these things about myself before I became an entrepreneur. Um, I had, you know, like your mother, my mom encouraging me. I mean, my mom made me feel like I can do anything. There was not a stone that I was not able to turn over and there was not a problem that I was not capable of solving. And she would say, you can do this. You know, she believed in me. And then I had a seventh grade teacher, science teacher who before I even realized these things about myself, you know, as kids, he's telling me, I've taught a lot of kids and you're, you're very bright and you're very capable and you're going to do something really great someday. And, you know, you're in seventh grade and you think, well, oh, okay, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. but I have replayed th- those words in my mind, even at my most vulnerable times in higher education or when I was even getting ready to take my OBGYN oral boards, which was one of the most terrifying things you're ever going to do as a human being, is sit in front of a panel of experts in your field and, and a- get drilled and answer questions. And are you, ca- are you competent to practice? You know, right. that. I thought, you know, I replayed that in my mind that Mr. Hickox in seventh grade said of all the people, and he's taught a lot of people that I'm bright and I can do this and I can do hard things. And so I think I already knew that I could do hard things. And so I, so now that I've started this business, I wouldn't say that I've really learned anything about myself as a woman per se, but what I have realized is that I have an ability to be a mouthpiece for other women and to set an example, and if I can make the path a little easier for the next person, then that's what I want to do. So I guess I've learned that I'm pretty powerful as a woman. I have the ability to um, to make things easier for those that will come after me. Awesome. So in closing, Shannon, if you think over your life and career, and you had the chance to thank only one person whose support was critical to you personally or professionally, who would that be and what would you say? Wow. You're going to make me cry. Mm-hmm. I'm just in the thick of it right now, so much right now. Yes. It's, it's just so close to the surface. I, I think, um, hands down, my mother, she's taken a lot of... Uh, I was not easy to raise. And while I wasn't, I wasn't mischievous, like I wasn't doing illegal things. And I was tough because I had my own vision for where I wanted to go. And she believed in me and she tolerated a lot of that. And, uh, and now she does not let doubt creep into my mind. She, and she's, she's right in that you know, that I do have it in me to make this happen. And I don't get discouraged very easily, but I do share pain points with her. And she never says, wow, boy, sounds like you kind of got beat on that one. She's just like, Shannon, listen, you've picked yourself up and dusted yourself off so many times when X, Y, or Z has happened. And if anybody's going to do it, it's going to be you. And if I had to put my money on anybody, it would be you. Because you are like a dog with a bone. You will not give up. And, and uh, so I would say my mom, just her tireless uh, support and love for me from the, be- you know, the beginning. Moms are awesome. You know, uh, and um, I just, I hope everybody has that kind of support from their mother. Uh, but she's my biggest fan. And uh, she was an RN. And so I think the reason I went into OBGYN is because she was a labor and delivery nurse and she had, we had great dinner conversation <laughs> and she, and she just always pushed me higher. You know, are you setting your goals high enough? And are you thinking big enough? And so that's what she has, has given me. So I would say my mom. That's beautiful. Thank you. I'm crying. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I really, I relate to that being so close to my mom. And I know people who have had lucky enough to have or still have their moms in their lives. It's just, it's a powerful connection if you're able to form that and having a mother who believes in you. Sometimes when she, I know for me, believes in you, even when she's not sure that it's going to work out, you know, but she believes she in you. She doesn't say it out loud. Exactly. <laughs> she believes in you. But she's scared yeah. to death. So that's beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that. Sending you a virtual hug. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I, it's, uh, it's just, it's such a, it's, it's such a powerful thing. I'm so passionate about 
this process and it and and a lot of sacrifices have had to be made on behalf of my family mm-hmm. in order to do this but um I'm but I they they see the greater purpose in it so so now tell us what are the ways that we can support you I'm sure everyone <clears throat> wants to know more about Lumi and how to find out about it so tell us where we can find you and ways to get in touch yeah. with you Yeah 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 so right now we're sold exclusively on our website uh, at lumido.com and that's spelled L U M E D-O, D-E-O dot com. So Lumi Deodorant dot com. But we, we truncated it because we realized that some people have thick thumbs and deodorant's <laughs> not an easy word to spell. Or people so like either, me don't know how to spell it. <laughs> <laughs> so you can either do Lumi, just, you know, Google search Lumi Deodorant. You'll find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Uh, but our website, uh, we ship free to anywhere in the continental U.S. And we're working on international shipping as we speak. Um, and that uh, you can reach out to me if you want to email me questions at heylumi at lumideodorant.com. And I welcome any dialogue, any questions that you have. We have a ton of information on our website. The blogs are truly me. I've, I've written every single one of them as if I'm having a conversation with, with you. And I, try and, and I just share a lot of stories and personal experiences that I have. But most importantly... The vagina is not to blame. That's right. <laughs> and and we discuss that over and over and over <clears throat> on my website. And so you might find those kind of interesting, a little funny, a little unsavory, uh, but true. They're very, very authentic. So excellent. I'd ask so, you to check that out. Lumi, L-U-M is in Mary, D-E-O dot com. And then hey, Lumi at Lumi Deodorant dot com to get in touch with you. That's right. Excellent. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Shannon. This was fantastic. I mean, I'm just I'm I'm fired up about your your mission <laughs> and your your vision. And I know I will be in touch with you more. This is great. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Of course. Now, before you go, what's a parting piece of advice from you to our listeners about anything? Oh, I mean, hands down, the thing that I've learned the most uh, about myself is it's important to remain authentic. Because when you, you, have a, you get a lot of cooks in your kitchen, a lot of people offering advice on how they feel you should approach your passion. And some people have suggested that I water down the, the feminine hygiene area and come in mainly as an underarm product. And oh, by the way, you can use this anywhere on your body. And that message is not nearly as powerful as my authentic truth, which is this product started off as a feminine hygiene product that, oh, by the way, also works amazingly well as an underarm deodorant Mm -hmm. and and so you need to because what happens is you miss out on who your core followers are your core audience who are you really speaking to if you're not even if you're trying to make your message too broad so i i would say remain authentic trust your gut uh, follow your instincts and your judgment because when you trust other people to do what you know in your heart you can do better you will be disappointed so while you need to hire people that elevate you, remain in charge of what your vision is and what your true core message is. Excellent. That's, that would be my advice. <laughs> Excellent advice. Shannon, thank you so much. Hold on just a second. All right. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Shannon. Very enlightening. I know I can't wait to get my Lumi. I hope you get yours too. To find out more about Shannon and to get in touch with her and to find out more about Lumi deodorant, make sure you go to supportissexypodcast.com. Go to that search icon at the top and just search Shannon. S-H-A-N-N. O-N. Her show notes page will pop up with all of the links, the resources, and the ways to get in touch with her. Support is sexy, podcast.com, and just search Shannon. Also, if you are an inventor or you have an idea, you have a brand, anything that you want to create this year, you have this vision, but you just don't have it down on paper or in front of you. If you're in Atlanta on February 19th, I want you to join me for Support is Sexy Vision. We are creating vision boards, getting together to not only just create vision boards, but to also release anything that does not serve us, to come up with what we really want, and to create our vision vision boards for the year. It's not too late. You can create a vision board anytime. And I'm bringing together a group of 25 women. So there's only 25 spots to create your vision boards. It's going to be a day of fun, productivity, and vision. So if you're here or going to be here, please go to supportissexyvision.com to find out more about the event and to get your tickets. 
Support is sexy, vision.com. February 19th, 2018 in Atlanta, Georgia. Let's get together and create your vision. All right. So again, thank you so much for listening. If you love this episode, I'm sure Shannon would love to hear from you. We'd love to hear a review. Let me know what you think wherever you're listening or be sure to get in touch on social media at Elaine Fluker at Support is Sexy. I'd love to chat with you again. Thanks for being here. It would not be the same without you. So until we chat again, always remember you deserve support and I'll talk to you soon. Take care.